Welcome back, everybody. It's time once again for one of our favorite shows this week with Wendy. The only show where you'll find real talk about the real SoCal a state of mind. With your host, Wendy Ross, who after a bunch of time working at real estate brokerages in Silicon Valley in Orange County, she decided it was time to do something different. And so she did. She created Veracity Real Estate, a company that was designed to provide bespoke client advocacy at all price levels, something you just don't see in high cost luxury markets like Southern California. And through it all, she's built a company of data driven divas. That's what I call it. People who really take the data and dissect it like we do each and every week on this show. So let's start digging in with Wendy. Hey, Wendy. Hey, good morning, Paul. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. A um, lot of data these days is confusing me. I know. I know. It, I, I don't know what to make of it. Well, I'm going to, I'm just going to tease you a little bit this week since I, it's my guest is far more important than I am this week. Let's just be honest about it, okay? So this week I'm going to give you like a little taste, a, okay. little, a little tidbit, and then next week we're really going to get into the weeds on it, on the data. So I'm going to okay. make you wait a week. All right. All I'll, right. I'll wait a week and we'll see what happens. Yeah, because you know you can count on me for market analysis you don't find anywhere else, which is exactly why you're asking me this. You know? <laughs> exactly. And, and one of the ways that I get and I can provide this market analysis that you don't find anywhere else is because we work with experts who bring new opinions and experiences to light. So, and because so many of the benefits of investing in real estate and frankly, the pursuit of the American dream is you know, home ownership and it depends upon the cities in which we live, right? So this is why I invited the city of Costa Mesa's mayor, uh, the honorable John Stevens to join us today. So first time here for NOC Talk Radio. Thank you, sir. It's great to be here. I'm kind of Thank flattered. you, Wendy. My pleasure. Thank you, Paul. For, for those of you who don't know. Uh, the city council directly appointed Mayor Stevens in 2021 to replace former Mayor, Mayor Katrina Foley because she was uh, she vacated her seat when she was elected to the County Board of Supervisors to serve the second district. He was originally elected to city council in 2016, collecting the second highest number of votes in a field of seven candidates. And since then, Mayor has been involved in some of the most sweeping initiatives to modernize the city and give residents even more reason to call Costa Mesa their home. Mayor Stevens serves on council ad hoc committees relating to the cannabis industry and the Fairview Developmental Center. He also served on ad hoc committees for the Costa Mesa Motor Inn litigation, which I think we've all heard about, and that's been um, you know, highly contentious, but that is a topic for another day. He even initiated the city's Independence Day celebration, and he's been Santa Claus at Snoopy House for the last four years. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> I love this. I love this. Again, I'm just so pleased to have you here, Mary Stevens. Thank you. Yeah, I was born to be Santa Claus, so that's I that's love good. it. You know what? For someone to be so serious and so jovial, it's kind of the perfect balance because you deal with really heavy, weighty topics. You've got to have a bit of a sense of humor. Absolutely. The one we're going to talk about today is very, very heavy topic. It's so important. I, I really can't wait. But, but first, let me just kick off my show with a quick look at the Orange County real estate market and give Paul that little tease he was asking for. Yeah, please. So last week was actually the first week of the month of August. So this is our week to date and our month to date update, kind of all in one. 414 residential homes sold, closing escrow last week, and the median price is still right there at $995,000. We keep hovering right around that million dollar mark. Those closed sales closed in 13 median days on market, 21 average days on market, which is still hyper, hyper fast. And that's because many of them continue to be negotiated off market. So by the time the data is inputted into the source that we all use, the MLS service, they show zero days on market. So the data really is unreliable. Per Jonathan Lasner, got a shout out to Jonathan who likes to blow holes in my data. Yes, I know, it's flawed, it's not my fault. But what I find more interesting is the days on market for those that are in escrow. We have almost 1,100 that are pending sale, and those have 15 days median and 25 average days on market. But the newer ones, just over 1,100 that most recently opened escrow, they have 37 median and 45 average days on market. So we see the trend is moving towards longer times on market, which is normal. It's so exciting. We have about 4,050 active listings on the market, and those even that are under contract yet, they have 31 median and 41 average days on market. So we still have too little inventory because in August we would normally have between eight and 10,000 homes come active. Um, so to have 4,000 standing, I really would rather see us build this up to 6,000 to 6,500 by end of month. That would mean that we had returned to normal. Um, and bear in mind too, in a normal market, when homes are priced above a million dollars in 
than most of ours are, it would historically have taken 40 to 60 days to sell those. And in off season, it would take four to six months to sell those. So we're still in a hyper accelerated market. This is why people prices aren't falling. Repeat after me. This is why prices aren't falling. Okay. I'm going to get off my soapbox. We're returning to normal. People just forgot what that looked like. So mm. I'm here to tell you. I did look outside, though, and it looks like the sky is falling. <laughs> <laughs> I just to that. No joke. I mean, I just, it, it gets a little, it, it gets a little exasperating um, explaining to people who desperately want to think the sky is falling that it's not. You know, do yeah. I wish prices would fall? Yeah. I think our, our county is becoming radically you know unaffordable and that dismays me there are people who work very hard who deserve home ownership who are having a challenge with it but you know i'm kind of getting ahead of myself so as you know every week i ask notable names to join me so we can get a behind the scenes analysis of what's going on in the market and in the sub markets within the greater whole um, i want you to understand what's going on it's, it's some experts you know don't want you to know what's going on, but we do because we know that when you know what's happening, you can make your home the best investment possible because you'll know how this game is being played. So this brings me right back to our guest today, Mayor John Stevens. And in, his, in addition to his leadership with the city of Costa Mesa, he's been a practicing trial attorney since 1989. So the man knows a little something about something. Veterans Legal Institute also recognized his firm, Stevens Friedland LLP, as law firm of the year in 2019. That delights me. And that's something we were very, very proud and honored to have that. You know, I, I keep forgetting how many ways our paths cross, and I think that just means that we're just, we're meant to be um, aff affiliated. We're meant to be connected. Yeah, here we are. I know. Here, and I'm just I'm so thrilled. And you know, I, I'm sure you know, as my listeners know. Um, or may not know, I don't know. I'm also a bad advocate at Veterans Legal Institute, and I think I'm their newest board member. Oh, wow. So, congratulations. Thank you. It's they, a great organization. They do so much good. Yeah. So much good. And and the work that they do touches on um, our enlisted personnel and, of course, the veterans previously enlisted and helping to make sure that they are housed and that they get health care and that they get education, that they get jobs. And all of this fits squarely into the conversation that we have with you. Um, so... What I would like to ask you first and foremost is how do you think all of those years of being a business person and an attorney locally have informed your ability to serve the city? Well, you know, at bottom, I'm a resident. So I've been a resident of the city. I think you said, I'm not sure you said this. I've been a resident of the city since uh, 1989, 33 years. So I went to UC Davis Law School. We moved down here, got it. Uh, we were new, really newly married. We, we'd been married for three years, got married just before we went to law school. Mm -hmm. And we were young kids in our 20s, um, got an apartment mm -hmm. and then get this, Wendy. So when I was about, I had a good job, you know, I went to a good school and I had uh, good grades in the school. And, and so afterwards I got, I got a very good job with a good law firm. And when I was 20, eight years old mm -hmm. i bought my first house that's really impressive for two hundred and sixty one thousand dollars that you remember the number is phenomenal yeah i love beautiful that. three beautiful three bedroom house mm -hmm. and then we started to have children we had uh, spent most of the 90s having children and we have four now and that's incredible. Uh, and so we sold that house after our third child mm -hmm. we just ran out of room i was gonna say you needed rooms needed a five bedroom so we move across the town to mesa verde and buy a five bedroom house and then uh, lo and behold we had a fourth child so <laughs> that house we purchased for uh three hundred and sixty seven thousand dollars in 2000. so the world has changed and you talk about the, the home ownership and having a young family break mm -hmm. into home ownership it, mm -hmm. it's so difficult in this day and age and it's also difficult we're going to talk about a lot of different topics and i don't want to go on about this too long but it's also difficult for somebody like me who i consider to be a very privileged person bought at the bottom of the market held their house for a long time has seen a great amount of appreciation in their house mm -hmm. low property taxes mm -hmm. good income mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to be 60, so I'm kind of on the back end of this thing we call life. And hey, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> no, I know. I look at it. I, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm not far behind you, so it's like I don't want to hear that. <laughs> true, but I'm going, I'm going down the hill. I'm not living to be 130. <laughs> I wouldn't want to. But, but for us to have the perspective, especially as, as city leaders, to put ourselves in the position of 
those people that are 20, mm -hmm. on 30, young families who are trying to break into a very difficult marketplace, a marketplace with the prices that you're talking about. Uh, many of them, if they're professional, they're saddled with uh, uh, student loans. Exactly. Copious student debt. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And, but they're already working here. Yeah, so exactly. Why and, can't they live here? Well, that's what we're working on. We're yeah. trying to figure out a way that people can work in in Costa Mesa or the area mm -hmm. and uh, stay here. Mm -hmm. It's better for our community. It's better for the people who, because so we, we are job rich in Costa mm -hmm. Mesa. We Absolutely. Could talk, we could talk about that. Um, but it's better for our community. It's better for the environment if people live near their work. Yes. And so we're trying to achieve that as best we can, uh, but it's not easy because of the affordability aspect of it. it, it precisely. And and I know that you are busy running your city, but that's a mantra. That, that's drum I be almost every week when we do this show is that it is – we have to take a look at how we're going to make this more affordable because the bifurcation, uh, the income gap, the wealth gap is real. You know, we are fast becoming haves and have nots, and that doesn't make for a stable environment. You know, especially not, you know, I'm going to a little soft segue here. What I love about Costa Mesa is that the city's motto is the city of the arts. Well, people who are artisans and people who are in performing arts um, and fine arts aren't typically the highest paid. That's right. So we don't want to lose that. that that's part of the fabric of our community. Um, it, there's so much to it. So it, is there anything else you can share with us, little tidbits about your city that may not be well known? Well, I mean, I look, at, I, I could go on and on. I could fill the whole <laughs> hour about Costa Mesa. I'll I, have you I, back. Don't worry. I, I consider Costa Mesa the, the best city in the state of California. And I know somebody would argue with me, but they'd lose. We, <laughs> we, we have uh, – I don't even know where to start. We've got beautiful performing art, yes. performing art center. Yes. Um, we're going to have uh, – the Orange County Museum of Art is coming in to Costa Mesa mm -hmm. on, on October 8th. We have beautiful A-class office space in Costa Mesa. We have the best uh, shopping center in the whole region in South Coast Plaza. It's actually one of the best in the world. In last the world, I heard. Yes. yes. I mean, people come from all over the world, from Asia to shop there. Yep. Restaurants, forget about it. We have the best restaurants in all of Orange County. We have four of the top six restaurants. We're the only city in Orange County with three Michelin star restaurants. I didn't realize that. Yes. Which yes. are they? Okay, so I knew you were going to ask me that. Um, e two of them are easy, and the, the last one, I think I'm going to mess up the name, but it's uh, Knife Pleat. Oh, yes, yes, yes. That's in South Coast Plaza. I've wanted to go there, yeah. Taco Maria oh, in, yeah. at SoCo. SoCo. And then Hanare, which is a sushi place at the lab. No way. The sushi way. place at the lab Got has a Michelin has a star. Michelin star. So those are the only three restaurants with Michelin stars in in Orange County. Um, and we have the fair. People are at the yes, fair right now. Right now. The, we're the action sports uh, um, uh, capital of the world mm -hmm. with Vans is here, Volcom's here. Mm -hmm. It's just unbelievable what we have. Ruka. I love it. Uh, it's, it's a city. And then, you know, we have the fine dining, but we also have the best dive bars. We've got the Goat Hill Tavern. We've got, you know, Tony's place. I mean, I places love it. where you could just kind of hang out till two in the morning. So, I love it. So, but, and you know, the thing about it is, Wendy, is it's because our city is so spectacular mm -hmm. that causes a great demand. So many people want to live here. Yes. And then right now, one of the struggles is at any price point, we have 2.8% vacancy rate yeah. in Costa Mesa. Yeah. So people can't afford a house or an apartment. Right. Even if even if they had all the money in the world, they're just not on the market. All right, so what is the city's approach to this housing situation? Well, there's a, we've gone through a lot of, of things, uh, in, and I'm gonna get to the kind of the arena numbers and stuff that we're gonna talk about. One of the things we did though, which is I think pretty innovative is, and this has to do with home ownership, is it, the voters passed what's called Measure Q, which allows for cannabis retail stores. Mm -hmm. We placed a 7% tax on the cannabis retail stores. 1% okay. of it is devoted to two programs, one, per, one of the 7%. Got it. Okay? Mm -hmm. A first-time home buyers program, which we'll talk about in a second. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's interesting when you were talking about artisans and stuff, I didn't even think about how this other half is going to also help housing. It's public art. 
There you go. Okay. Yeah. So one half of that is going to go to public art. We're the city of the arts, but ironically and and kind of disappointingly, mm -hmm. we spend less of our public funds on art than almost any other city. That is kind of and an interesting so dichotomy, isn't it? Is, it isn't it strange? Yeah. So when we when we actually drilled down and we did our arts master plan and we found that out, we had figured we had to do something about it. So we have this new source of revenue coming in. Mm -hmm. And and so the the idea with the first time home buyers program is and we we're just going to get the funding. We have don't have a program, but I have a vision for the program. Okay. The vision would be Let's say um, somebody needs just a boost to get into a house. They mm -hmm. just need a little extra to get them over the hump. Perhaps on a, a down cost or, on a yeah. down payment, closing costs, whatever the case mm -hmm. may be. They apply. They got to be Costa Mesa residents or grew up in Costa Mesa, and um, they and the first time home buyer. And so we interest free. We grant them that money. Put a deed of trust the back end of their house, all subordinate to whoever else they want. Got it. When they sell the house, they return the money, no interest. It goes and it goes to somebody else. That's incredible. So see, and these are things that I talk to home buyers, would be home buyers about all the time. That you really have to dial into the city because different municipalities have different, you know, opinions and. Uh, relationships to first-time home buyers, and some of them, like yours, are a bit more forward-thinking, and that's probably a city where you want to live. Well, yeah, I mean, frankly, we, we're trying. Yeah, we're trying. I mean, it's difficult. Small I mean, steps, you it's know, small and, steps. and and of course, the big you, as part of housing, mm -hmm. a big thing you can't uh, you you can't ignore homelessness. Correct. So, we in 2019 established a bridge shelter. Uh, it was first a temporary, and then uh, later a permanent shelter. And out of that shelter since 2019, we've housed, found permanent housing for 225 people. That's pretty incredible. Now, would you just think about it? I mean, just think about that. If there were 225 people here, you'd know it. It would be a big group. It would be a big group. And those are people that were on our streets mm -hmm. who are now in permanent shelter. Mm -hmm. And something that I think our citizenry misses is that when you take someone who is on the streets and you put them into a temporary housing situation and you allow them a little bit of dignity, they are better able to pull their lives together and get into a permanent housing situation. And taking them off the streets and getting them into permanent housing and getting them into the workforce and getting them to contribute to the community benefits all of us. Absolutely. And and you know, the in, in our in our shelter too, the reason why we had such great success is when somebody comes into the shelter they immediately start working on their housing plan. Marvelous. And the whole idea is when you come in there, the whole idea is for you to matriculate out mm -hmm. to permanent housing. And sometimes it's more difficult than others. But, you know, yeah. whatever people talk about, and I do agree that drugs are a problem, mental illness are a of problem, course. or whatever. Of course. But whatever you're struggling with, and we all struggle with something, mm -hmm. okay, it's better to be struggling it in some place that's warm and dry. Right. Where you're not, at, you know, at risk of the elements or being, you know, harassed by the police or just, uh, you know, angry citizens or, or, or. Right. And, and sadly, a large number of these people are veterans. You can contact Veterans Legal Institute for help. We will help you with housing. We will help you with mental health professionals. We will help you. You know, we, we want to help. So we just, we can't scream this loudly enough. Um, and I want to, I want to circle back for a moment because you said something about Rena. Um, so I want to just share with the listeners what that is. So back in 1969, uh, California mandated that all cities, towns, and counties must plan for the housing needs of our residents, all of them, regardless of their income. So this state mandate is called the Housing Element and Regional Housing Needs Allocation, or Rena. So it's updated in eight-year cycles. Um, and it's so that they can keep step with you know the immediate near-term needs of the residents. So this means that every city, including Costa Mesa, is required by law to update its housing needs um, every eight years. So can you tell us where you are with this process now? Sure, yeah. So the housing element is part of our general plan. Right. And, and as you said, it's updated every eight years. And what has, what has happened in our case is, uh, in all cities, there's, um, there's a housing crisis in Costa Mesa. It's recognized th pretty much throughout the state. Mm -hmm, it is. And uh, I don't think there's a lot of debate that there's a housing crisis. It's not like, you know, climate deniers or whatever. It's, it's, there's not a lot of housing deniers. Mm -hmm. So um, what the state of California did is allocate a number of units that need to be built over that eight year arena cycle f 
to different regions. Mm -hmm. And so ours, uh, that governs our region is SCAG, uh, Southern California Association of Governments. And then they pushed though used a formula that we fr frankly disagreed with but they used a formula and they kind of spread those units out throughout uh, southern california weighting the coastal coastal uh, uh, areas because under their theory um, the inland empire had kind of done their share and so that they wanted to so they just get the, they wanted to force greater density in the, our areas yeah get the coastal cities to step up a bit and so we got costa mesa eleven thousand seven hundred and sixty units now let me put that that's in, a lot of it's a lot of units let me put that into some perspective there's there's about forty two thousand units in costa mesa that have been built since before the city was incorporated in 1953 so in all that time, so so the the idea, just the mere idea, and many of those, um, I don't have the exact numbers, but many of them are uh, moderate, low, and very low units of the of the eleven thousand seven hundred and sixty. So the very idea that we would be able to build in eight years uh, that amount of units in the city is just un completely unrealistic. It's an incredible number. But, it's nearly a twenty five percent increase. And, and it, so unfortunately, what happens is. Um, you know, it's kind of like when you have that big number, um, you know, like sometimes I feel like my clients do this. They, they, they owe me a lot of money, so they don't pay me anything. You right. know what I mean? Right. And uh, sorry, clients, uh, but uh, <laughs> didn't mean to throw you under the bus there, but I guess you don't, you deserve it if you're Just not paying saying. me. But, you know, you, you have the, this big number, and so people are like, oh, I don't want that big number, so mm -hmm. I don't want to do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, that's well, kind of human nature. You're right. That's not an option. So it, rather than doing what I think always works in government is incremental, incrementally addressing a problem, whether it be crime, homelessness, whatever it is, the social issue is to deal with it incrementally. And then before you know it, years and years and years and years later, if you have steady uh, um, commitment to addressing the issue, it's going to shrink substantially. Right. You're going to make some serious headway over time. Yeah. So there's a little bit of, of concern over that number. and But I just forget about the number. I say, okay, look, at what is wh what can we do and what do we have to do? Mm -hmm. So we have to do this um, housing element. So we submitted it to the city, sorry, to the state um, and to get certification. Mm -hmm. um, in order to do that, we had lots of meetings. We had uh, many Zoom meetings. This was back in the day of Zoom, primarily. Mm -hmm. um, we did surveys where we got almost 500 responses. We had meetings of the Planning Commission, all public, meetings of the Planning Commission, study sessions of the City Council, meetings of the City Council. I can't imagine how contentious all of this must have been. You know, it wasn't really that bad because, really? well, because people, uh, people, I think were, um, p the people at Costa Mesa are great. I mean, they, they, they understood that there was an issue and they're trying to be constructive, I would mm -hmm. say. So there's a lot of constructive feedback and, and we kind of drew from that feedback to come up with our plan about what do we, what do we want to see and where do we want to see it? Mm -hmm. So we have a great opportunity. One place is Fairview Developmental Center which is state owned. It's right in the center of Costa Mesa. It's 102 acres. And um, that's a great opportunity for housing. Mm -hmm. We are uh, we just got uh, granted, I think it was $3.5 million for our city to kind of study that and work with the state on how that's going to be developed. So we're looking for 2,500 units to be at Fairview Developmental Is there center. any resistance to rezoning it for that purpose? No, 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 great. no, 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 really not. I mean, the only thing I will say is that people in Costa Mesa look at Fairview Developmental Center and they they're it's like a blank easel, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's like mm -hmm. what could we do there? We're going to maintain a lot of open space. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a bit of a village there, you know, where and that 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 only makes sense in it delivering does. all these units is that it's somewhat self-contained. So it's a place well, exactly. where you can live, you can go to get a cup of coffee, you can go to the dry cleaner, you can buy your essentials. Have a you little market there, right. Get your hair done, whatever it is you need to do there. Because this blue doesn't just happen. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it looks great. Thank you. So um, so anyway, Fairview Developmental Center is great. And then 
other than Fairview Development. I, I, by the way, I want a water park there. That's what I want. Like water slides. Look and at stuff. you. See that there's the kid in you coming out again. I why, love that. Why? Why does Irvine get Wild Rivers and Costa Mesa doesn't get anything? We need to have some type of of water park in Costa Mesa. Well, Fairview Development. People, if you're listening. One of the ways you can be assured you'll get one step closer to a water park is to reelect this man. <laughs> Just good. saying. All right, moving on. Yeah, Shameless plug. Right, right. <laughs> running on the water park platform. Okay, it's going to appeal to some people. All right. So, 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 so anyway, so then, then that it throughout the city, throughout the city, um, we needed to identify housing opportunity sites, mm -hmm. and so we talked to the citizens, talked to the property owners, looked at the map work with the planning commission staff was heavily involved in this and identified a lot of throughout the city ha uh, housing opportunity sites many of them north of the 405 and in certain commercial corridors that was what i was hoping to yeah, hear because we're we're a built we're a built city so there's going to have to be to increase units there's going to have to be some infill development mm -hmm, mm -hmm. taking the idea is to take um, commercial underperforming commercial property mm -hmm. turn it into mixed use exactly and and have people be able to live there and work there and exist in an area and have a real community there absolutely and other cities and counties around the world have done this successfully for hundreds of years it's you know it works if done properly well you know the funny part about it is we've done it in costa mesa because if you think about so we're talking about the other side of the 405, west part of the side of the of north of the 405, mm -hmm. but east side north of the 405 where we hang out all the time. That's where my office is. That's, That's where true. the center tower is and, mm -hmm. you know, water grill and any number of places where you can hang out the Performing Arts Center. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of units in there. There's a lot of residential units. Yeah. Uh, the Enclave has... Um, uh, 850 residential units there. And then they've got 580 Anton, right. House, Halcyon House is just going online. 3400 Avenue of the Arts is going to go online. So there's a lot of people living east of, in the east kind of metro. Right. East side of South Coast, South Coast Metro. Yeah. And, and that type of living in this semi-urban, or it's as urban as we have in Orange County, quite bluntly. Um, but a lot of people who have gone off and gotten their advanced degrees and have come down to work in that financial services corridor really embrace living near where they work and being right. able to walk to a great restaurant and walk to this really cool open space. Um, people don't understand how much cool art there is within walking distance of that area. I yeah. used to live there. I love it. And, and, and I read a, a, a statistic that 25% of the people who live in that area mm -hmm. work in that area. So those are 25% of the people who, they're not driving a car. Right. They're walking to work. Right. I mean, they're walking to the Met, they're walking to the Center Tower, the Plaza Tower, the Park Tower, uh, you know, uh, Pacific Arts. One of my dear friends is, is exactly that. Walks everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Owns a car, never drives it. Yeah. You know, so yeah. talk about the, the benefit to the environment. I mean, there's so many layers of benefit here. But you got to do it right. Well, yeah. And, and speaking of doing it right, I mean, sometimes that the best laid plans with the best of intentions, either in business or in life, um, backfire and have unintended consequences. So it, speaking of unintended consequences and backfiring, can, can you talk to us about measure why, what is it, and um, what was it intended to do? Yes, yes, yes. So Measure Y was uh, enacted in 2016. You mentioned that I was elected there. So I'm kind of fond of the voters of 2016. I, I think they got, very <laughs> they got good, most things right. They got very good. And their intentions were good. They got very good judgment and their intentions were rather good. <laughs> so we had a, a situation in Costa Mesa that kind of was brewing since about 2010 until 2016. And we had some political setbacks in 20, uh, uh, 2014 in terms of the candidate mm -hmm. uh, that – one of our candidates that lost by 47 votes. But the people that were in, in charge there at the time um, were very developer friendly and they thought that we needed to bring units into the city and they weren't as kind of open to the community's concerns about where the units were being placed and, mm -hmm. and, and how the units were kind of encroaching on traditional single family residential and things of that nature. So there was a group of citizens who, who put on the ballot Measure Y. And they did it in, you know, you know, in all good faith and goodwill. And, uh, in, and in response to what they were seeing as overdevelopment and 
lack of thoughtful development. Okay. So the theory was we're going to put an item on the ballot. It's going to say if a project has certain characteristics, if it is, if there's a uh, an amendment to the general plan or the zoning or the or the overlays, plus some level of um, uh, of intensity of use. So uh, 40 units or more, uh, uh, 200 car trips a day, things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, things that show intensity of use, and also it had a uh, reach, re, it reached out to um, the units or the, the test measure for intensity covered a cumulative over a half a mile. So, okay. uh, you know, so if somebody built theoretically something that was going to add 35 units, then you had six within a half a mile that you could do without triggering measure Y. Okay. So what ended up happening though um, and and the theory is we're going to empower the voters, sure, right? Which right. which is 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 in its sense it's good, you know. Right. It's like we we need to have more voter oversight over what the city council is doing because mm -hmm. it affects their lives. That makes complete sense. I, I'm not suggesting that you know the mo like I say the motives were clear, but the outcome of that is is that there have been no developments. See, and here there is the no unintended votes. consequence, yeah. right? So there, it just it it stopped everything. Yeah, there there. There are, there have been no votes. There will be no votes, ever. So the and the and the reason for that is, um, it's very, very difficult for a developer uh, to say I'm going to put my capital at risk. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go all the way through the process of gaining site control, design, entitlement. Mm -hmm. which can take up to two years. All the studies they have to do, all the, it's EIR, really everything, yes. go through the entire process, CEQA, everything, yeah. and then say, voters, you want to vote for this? And right. the people say, I don't like it. Right. Boom, you lose. Right. Now, all of that capital is flushed down the toilet. Banning Ranch was a great example. Now, well, we talk about Banning Ranch. <laughs> we, we can have another discussion. We'll talk Banning. another day. But, but anyhow, um, so, so what's happened is developers have just declined and, and to, we've to, noticed to, that, to, that. to participate. As a result, Wendy, so we go from this kind of rushing river of development down to like a stream a that's getting smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. And so since 2019, in the last three years, we've only had 22 units that have been approved in Costa Mesa Good be built grief. 22 units and in this year mm -hmm. in this year 20 now there's not nothing going in 22 mm -hmm. zero and, All we're right. in, and we're in August so I understand that the city council is coming up with something to like ease this this log jam with, with the loggerhead so so what is this upcoming ballot measure and what is it intended to do to help with this yeah, so in October of last year, we assigned a ad hoc committee of our city council, Jeff Harlan, Arliss Reynolds, and Andrea Marr, to come up with some solutions. Okay. And so they did a lot of outreach. We, they did some further surveying. They had some public meetings. And finally, last week, so this is very um, topical, on, uh, on the 2nd of August, um, we voted to put an item on the ballot. The item would go on the ballot, and what it would say is basically, um, in Measure Y would not apply to developments in certain corridors. Okay. North of the 405, down Bristol. And, and they're all commercial corridors. Got it. So we're not looking to displace people from their residences. We're not looking to develop in the single family residential Yeah, we're not talking zones. Mesa Verde here, people. Right. We're yeah. talking about the commercial corridors north of the 405 and an area. So, so it would be uh, Newport Boulevard. And, you know, Newport Boulevard has always been kind of a, a difficult place. I mean, it's, it's underperforming. Uh, there's a lot of, um, you know, issues with homelessness mm -hmm. and a lot of issues with crime. And, and it's just not a place as you drive down Newport Boulevard that you're particularly proud of. Right. And uh, to address those things, homelessness, crime and stuff like that, I, I call it the three the three things that uh, that address those most are lighting, security and activity. Yes. Lighting, security, activity. Um, when we built our library, 
as you may remember, that area was a homeless I do. encampment. Mm-hmm. And people thought, what are these guys doing? Why? And people come up to us, why are you building a library where the homeless encampment is? And I'm like, just watch. Trust me. We'll build that library and there won't be a homeless encampment mm-hmm. because of lighting, security, and activity. So in some of our areas that are, that are f- kind of uh, – struggling because also of the shift in how people buy retail you know mm-hmm. they don't buy retail at a storefront brick and mortar they mm-hmm. they do it online so some of these areas are struggling and they're looking for revitalization and so in those areas there could be revitalization and what we're going to also do if this passes we'll do a complete revision visioning visioning mm-hmm. with this with the citizens where we have public meetings and we have we hire a consultant and we'll say what do you want these corridors to look like? Right. What do you want them to look like? Um, what is it? What's their potential? Mm-hmm. You know, and kind of get out of our own heads and our own vision, mm-hmm. and bring it to the people, and really hear from them. And so the idea is that we would be able to, over time, start to, as I said, incrementally deliver some more product to people to live in some type of a live work environment that would over time, reduce the cost of housing and okay. providing more supply. So I want to hear what the particulars are on the ballot measure that will get us from here to there, but we need to take a quick break and have Paul you know, do a little shout out to our sponsor. Okay. Let's do it because uh, as we know, as you've proven here again today, you bring together a who's who list of uh, advisors and partners. And one of them is our longtime sponsor here, Ford and Dulio. Ford and Dulio is an Orange County-based boutique litigation firm with experienced attorneys from the big law firms. They did so when they created this thing to do something different, which is to find a way to align their interests with the client's interests. That means they're rewarded for being efficient and effective, not just for dragging out the litigation and running up the bills. And where they engage in the relentless pursuit of their client's goals, whether in litigation, mediation, or at trial. That's something you're interested in learning more about? Simple place to find them, forddiulio.com, F-O-R-D-D-I-U-L-I-O, forddiulio.com. Okay. I got to say just at the top of my uh, thought. <laughs> I knew know, it was coming. There I we gotta go. I got to say, <laughs> any guy that not only shouts out the arts, but the coolness of the dive bars like the Goat Hill Tavern New York, <laughs> there's a guy who knows his community. I mean, there's that a guy. That is a man to yeah. stay in office. That's Thank a you man. very much. Forever. He likes the high. He likes the low. Exactly. I do love Costa Mesa. Um, one of the things that I'd love to hear about, we had somebody on a show, it seems like a year ago or whenever it was passed, but didn't Costa Mesa do something revolutionary where they uh, passed an ordinance, I think you sort of alluded to this, where they're going to let cannabis retailers in regular shopping centers, not just stuck in some industrial park in the middle of nowhere? If that was, if that, if my understanding is correct, you know, where's that at these days and how's that work? Yeah, great. Thanks, Paul. Great timely question. So, yes, we did. Uh, that was overwhelmingly passed to put cannabis retail in in commercial zones. Okay. So some of these same zones we're talking about mm-hmm. uh, that would be part of the, the corridors. And so we have a lot of applications. We have, I, some, somebody told me, 60 applications, but they're moving through the process slowly. It's, mm-hmm. it's a, to, you have to you have to really prove yourself to the staff and to the planning commission. So now we have eight mm-hmm. that have have uh, been approved and gotten uh, conditional use permits. And so they're gonna move forward and then do their building and do their tenant improvements. So it looks like this month, one August of 2022, at the latest next month, mm-hmm. we should have the first open. And then once that opens, then we'll start to get the flow for that first time home buyers program. That is interesting timing. We just one of them was just denied last night, though. Oh, wow. and it was um, it was in a place where um, it was incompatible to the to, to the residential neighbors. Mm-hmm. Uh, at least that was the finding of the of the of the planning commission. And uh, you know the the application applicants would be it, w- it would be wise to do a lot of outreach right. to people that right. are around there. It's very right. very important. Yeah, if because they're going to embed in the community, they need to make some friends. And people do, you know, people are concerned because it's a new use. Sure. And sure. so anything that's new, then people, um, you know, are concerned and they need to somebody to to explain to them what to expect. And yeah. then once, it's, my view is once we see the 
investment in our community mm-hmm. um, and uh, and the safety that we get and the revenue that we get, people are going to be really happy about it. All I can tell you is that I'm a huge fan of cannabinoids, and so is my dog. So. Yes. <laughs> There you go. Yeah. All right. So I'm I'm so sorry. This is more interesting, but I'm going to drag him right back to that whole response to Measure Y. Okay. So what's going on in the ballot, and, and what are, what are the hopes from that? Right. So what's going on in the ballot, kind of like I said, is is we would take Measure Y and essentially exempt certain parts of the city that are designated these corridors. So okay. north of the 405s, one corridor, Harbor, Bristol, Newport Boulevard. Uh, the Trinity Broadcasting Network mm-hmm. site, um, a few Baker, uh, a, a certain section of Baker, um, the Sobeka area, mm-hmm. and so then at that point it would be like the way it used to be, where people could obtain site control, do their work, go to the city council, talk, do the outreach necessary to see mm-hmm. if they have support for their projects, and then. At, at and then also we would do this visioning process that I talked about that's right, right in that's right in the ordinance um, and the 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 idea is that over t- over time gradually we're, we're going to revitalize those corridors and mm-hmm. find more places for people to live in environments where people want to live right you know that's the key is it's got to be where people want to live and we have to be cognizant of the concern that there there could be impacts, you know, well, sure. and, and, address, I, and, I and address those impacts as best we can. Having community forums and asking them about it. So am I correct in, in understanding what you're saying is that exempting those areas means that developers can go in, submit a plan, um, get conditional approval, spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars doing all of their studies and stuff and not worry about the citizen really saying no. Right. If they're in one of these designated corridors. Correct. Okay. If they move outside one of the corridors, then Measure Y would still okay. apply and you'd still have to have a vote. Um, so, you know, like, like I said, I, I, I really I don't think people should be caught up too much about – Although H- HCD, which is Housing and Community Development uh, Department at the uh, State of California, did put in their response to our housing element that mm-hmm. Measure Y constitutes a constraint and is uh, and, and could be something that could prevent us from getting our housing element certified. If if we don't get our housing element certified, several things could happen. Uh, we could get fined heavily. We could lose. We get a lot of grant money. Mm-hmm. I'll give you an example. We just got a grant. Thank you to Senator Dave Min. We just got a grant from the city, from the from the state of California, for ten million dollars to do our redo our parks. Wow. We got another one point two million dollars from Cotty Petrie Norris got us for another park, a specific park on the west side. Mm-hmm. We just got three point five million dollars. Cotty Petrie Norris got it to to redo our um, fire uh, training area right off of Placentia. It's going to be a regional tri- fire training area. All of that could go away. And those are all massive benefits for the citizens. Yeah, so all of that could So it's go a little away. bit of cutting off one's nose in spite of one's face, unintentionally, of course. Right. But we do want to improve areas that, and, and you can't say this, but I can, that are somewhat blighted. I mean, they're they're already underutilized, but they're somewhat blighted. I mean, there there are people hanging around there we don't want there, and if they were um, rehabilitated, then everyone wins. Well, right, yeah. I mean, I can say it. I mean, look at we have a a problem in particular in our city with calls for services to various motels. Right. I mean, we have some of the nicest motels hotels in mm-hmm. in in Orange County, but we also have kind of some ones that generate a lot of calls for service. Right. And we talked earlier about the Costa Mesa Motor Inn, which is being redeveloped now into a 200-unit uh, apartment complex with with nine affordable units mm-hmm. in that. I was involved in that. That's tremendous. Settling that litigation. Yes. But the other thing we're doing that I haven't talked about, but it touches on veterans' issues too, is we're we're working with all state and federal and county funds in Costa Mesa and the soup – sorry, the um, – the Motel 6 on Harbor mm-hmm. is going to be um, redeveloped into 88 units of permanent supportive housing for veterans and seniors at risk. So people that are either homeless or at risk of mm-hmm. being homeless. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So they would have a stable environment where they'd be able to get the services that they need. That's the, and that's such a great 
a great point is that they're not just getting housing, they're getting the services they need. Right. So we're trying to do this with all, we're basically, and we're open to suggestions, but the city is trying to figure out what levers do we have, what tools do we have in our toolbox to address homelessness, to address being opportunities for people to buy in our in, in our mm -hmm. city, opportunities for them to live comfortably close to their job, uh, in a way that enhances the community. Right. And and I know that I know that change for some people in the community is it creates some level of anxiety. Absolutely. And so I'm aware of that. But but change can be really good. It can. It can be good. It can be good. And. I, I suppose um, what I'm trying to do, mm -hmm. what I'm trying to do is to get out of my own existence. My own existence as a 30, what is it, 33 year, 31 year homeowner and try to think about it from the perspective of people who are tr having trouble finding shelter. Right. And I, and I applaud you for that. Thank you. Um, please promise me that we can have you back so we can talk about how these are going yes yes wonderful all right so before we wrap up you know i like to ask all my guest questions that are a little bit more personal it's like my version of the vanity fairs you know proust questionnaire type yeah, thing yeah. so i mean, obviously we know that you're a proud resident of costa mesa um but why did you choose to move there and raise your, your children there so uh, that's where i got my first job oh that's right and, and so i got i know i got my first job and i then i uh, but why did i stay there so i got my first job got an apartment that was all fine we had really good friends mm. that moved in and bought a house in costa mesa and we wanted to be close to them and they're just kind of like almost like our family that's wonderful so i'm i'm uh, actually doing the uh one of the da daughters is getting married and i'm an officiate that's how close we are to See, them. See, you so moved to be near family. We, we, they are like family. <laughs> okay. What's your most treasured possession? Um, so I knew you were going to ask me this question. And I don't really treasure a lot of possessions, but I do have my first year law books. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Property, civil procedure, torts, and um, contracts. And my daughter yesterday started law school. At UCLA Law School. That's really incredible. And so um, I went to UC Davis. She went to UCLA. So she's getting a little better than I am. And and I told her, I said, I still have those law books. They're That's just, incredible. they're highlighted just like they did when I was a little kid and I didn't know what I was doing. I love it. So this is going to be hard, I would imagine, given all that you have done. But what do you consider your greatest achievement so far? Okay. I probably should say my family, but... I'm that's 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 too trite of an mm. answer and there's no judgment here no I know but my family's awesome but um, I'll tell you one thing about my family I made up this thing a four by four we're gonna be a four by four and not many people can say this four kids mm -hmm. all graduating from college in four years wow that's pretty big stuff that's good stuff I would be proud of that too so I'd say that and then also the other thing in public service is that homeless shelter because that's yes. a permanent homeless shelter and people for generations will be going from living on the street to a safe place of shelter. And mm -hmm. it's because of our initiative back in 2018. It is the first of many steps. Yes. What is your personal motto? It's not really a motto, but my favorite, if I don't, uh, I don't have the quote, I should have brought it, but everybody should Google this persistence. Okay. Persistence. Mm -hmm. If, uh, Calvin Coolidge said that persistence is the most important quality to have and he's got this little motto I know has. of it you're absolutely right and he and he has this quote about persistence and how it's not intelligence it's not hard work it's hard work and everything like that and I think that if you really want to ask somebody an interview question mm -hmm. you say when when were you persistent That's a because great nothing point. nothing gets done the first time you have to be told no a number of times and then you have to come back with different angles in in law in public service in dealing with your family and dealing with your friends or whatever in life per man yes. persistence it's the real world i love it all right well before i let you go how can people reach you if they want to talk with you about anything well my cell phone number you should call me on my cell phone number. hello yeah no i'm serious it's a uh, 714-337-1872 also, my campaign website is um, Stevens, S-T-E-P-H-E-N-S, the word for, 
F O R Costa Mesa Stevens for Costa Mesa dot com. And, uh, but call me on the cell phone and I love or, it. or send me, you can send me an email too at uh, John at SF like San Francisco dash lawyers dot com. Great. And people, don't think you have to give money to the campaign. If you don't have money, find out how you can volunteer your time. You know, it, we'll take everything that we, you can give us to help p keep good people in office. So, Or, or just um, call me if you have an issue. I love it. You know, call All me right. if you have, especially in Costa Mesa, how, if I can help people. That's, that's what I'm here for is to serve people. You are amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. We're going to You're welcome. Gonna have fun. to wrap it. I appreciate it. All right. So please follow me, Wendy Ross, at, well, The Real Wendy Ross on Instagram, LinkedIn, or subscribe to this show on my website, realveracity.com, or just follow the podcast wherever you'd like to listen to podcasts. We're this week with Wendy. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Wendy.